Hi, I'd like to uh, thank you for coming to my talk today. My name is Rachel Guy. I'm from Warnell, and I'm going to be talking here about my dissertation research proposal. Now, just as a warning, it's not going to get real technical because uh, one of the things um, that has happened in the last couple of weeks is I was invited to come speak to the Garden Club of America at their annual business meeting in May. And so I'm thinking about presenting this to an audience that isn't technical. So this is where I was kind of going with this. Um, the title of my talk is Assessing the Socio-Ecological Response of Salt Marsh Estuary and Fishery to the Effects of Sea Level Rise. It used to say the impacts of sea level rise, but as uh, Cecil Jennings told me, fish aren't impacted unless you throw them off a building. So I'm <laughs> avoiding that phrase, and I apologize if I slip it in there somewhere. So my background's in landscape ecology, so let's start with the landscape. This is a salt marsh ecosystem, and it's an estuary ecosystem, and what makes it it's dominated by uh, Spartina alterniflora, and in Georgia, at least, it's uh, flat, flooded and drained twice a day during the tidal cycle. Now, what this uh, daily tidal cycle gives to the estuary is this transference of nutrients from the marine system to the terrestrial system and vice versa. This makes the system highly productive. And why this is important is because salt marshes are all th also thought to be critical nursery habitat for exploited aquatic species, and not just exploited aquatic species, a whole variety of aquatic species. And it does this through providing structural heterogeneity, um, shallow water predator refuge, and better forage through this higher productivity. And I just want to point out in Georgia, the, what you have down here, which one is my, there we go, we have spotted sea trout, which is not a trout. This is channel bass, which is not a bass. <laughs> um, both of these are very popular recreational species that are targeted here in Georgia. And this is one of my favorites. Um, they're pretty cute, and they're also kind of tasty. This is the blue crab, and it's also a commercial and a recreationally targeted species in Georgia. And salt marsh, as you've heard in other talks, is um, under threat by sea level rise. And I've got to thank Dean for covering this already a little bit. Um, so I don't need much introduction here in case you needed convincing that sea levels are actually rising. This is put out by the International Panel of Climate Change report in 2007. The red is the reconstructed data, the blue is the tidal gauge data, and the black is the satellite altimetry data. So in case you needed any more convincing, sea level is definitely on the rise. Um, and as Dean said earlier, sea levels are predicted to rise anywhere between, you know, about half a meter to almost two meters. For the purpose of this research, I'm going to take that more conservative estimate of about one meter. And so let's take this to a much more local geography. And by local, I mean the entire Georgia coast. <laughs> and um, this is the model from the sea level affecting marsh model. Now this is slightly out of date, but the processes are the same. Um, I want you to focus. Oh, wrong way. I want you to focus on this light blue area right here. Um, that's the salt marsh in Georgia, and in 2000, and si that's what it looks like from the National Wetland Inventory data. Um, and if you push it forward uh, into 100 uh, to 2100, you can see that a lot of that light blue has now disappeared and been converted. And so this obviously might be a problem. And this is all kind of intuitive. This loss of critical nursery habitat could lead to less recruitment in a population or a single species. And this has been shown when we see these loss of population in fish species to cause trophic cascades, to cause assemblage shifts, loss of diversity, and a loss of functional redundancy, which reduces the resilience to other externalities. And these are other externalities. And I'm not... <laughs> These, and it's the people, and they're not really external to the system. They are part of the system. They are using the system. And in Georgia, we can divide this into your non-commercial fishermen and your commercial fishermen. And what's interesting about this is that commercial fishermen have been kind of implicated for fisheries decline all over the world, and rightly so. They've, a lot of you probably have heard of the bluefin tuna population crashes and other, and other fish species. Um, population problems due to commercial fishing. Non-commercial fishermen have been kind of given a pass on this because the thought, the prevailing thought for many years has been one guy with his, with his rod and reel 
are not going to have the same impact as a as a you know a large vessel with nets taking lots of fish. And that's true, they're not. But in Georgia, at least, there's a lot more of those recreational fishermen than there are the commercial fishermen. Also, there's incongruent reporting requirements. Whereas the commercial fishermen are required to report their catch and their bycatch, commercial fishermen or non-commercial fishermen only need to do it on a voluntary basis. So, in, in light of this, I've decided to think about this ecosystem and think about this system um, for all of its parts in this conceptual model. And this is pretty complicated, so I'm not going to dwell on it right here. We're going to step through it. And I think the take home I want you to take from this is that you cannot think about any of these one pieces in isolation. I cannot think about the ecological without thinking about the social and the context that it's, it's situated in. So let's start with the actors. And it's, um, this is, again, very simplified. Uh, you have your fish and your crustaceans. Um, and who have influence over fishers. So if fishers have high catch success, uh, then they're going to come back to that area or they're going to come back to take fish from that area. Uh, and again, that take, as I said, with overfishing can also have influence on those fish and crustacean populations. Management oversees these interactions and they hand down regulations to the fishers. So they influence the fishers and the take the fishers have um, through the, these regulations. And the way management is um, informed about what these takes should be, in Georgia at least, is through fisheries dependent and fisheries independent data. So fisheries dependent data, again, is that report from the fisherman himself. And remember, that's pretty incongruent right now. And the fisheries independent data comes from people like me going out and collecting fish and for scientific purposes. So you've got this system right here. And, and in other systems, I should say, Management can also have direct influence on the fish and crustacean populations through stocking efforts. But in Georgia, this only happens with striped bass. It's not really done um, for like the red drum or the spotted sea trout. So let's talk about context. When you're thinking about these fish and crustaceans and these fishers, and this again, this is kind of coming from my landscape ecology background where everything is scalar. Let's think about that local ecological environmental context where these fish and fishers are meeting and what's going to influence what this meeting and how it happens is going to be um, includes vegetation that's present uh, whether or not there's bulkheads in the area that might have um, reduced the salt marsh uh, the width and the depth of the channel which may make it more or less attractive to fishers as well as fish uh, the salinity in that particular area but again that local context is influenced by a much larger regional ecological context. And this is where you have your meta population structure of your fish that would be feeding into whether or not a, a local population is present in, a, in an area. And it's also influ influenced by sound variabilities. There's eight sounds with eight different, or uh, I forget how many riverine systems coming into the estuaries. Um, but each of those are going to be a little bit different. Each of those have different development um, and different landscape characteristics and salt marsh characteristics. So that's also going to influence that local ecological context and how those fish and fishers interact. But there's also a local social environment where management and fishers are interacting. And this includes the access points to that fishers might have into that fishery. Is it free? Is it something they have to pay for? Who gets to access to that fishery at that particular locality? It's also the influence of your peers. What is the conservation attitudes um, between the other fishermen and yourself? I mean, are you going to reflect those attitudes? And that's going to change on a very local basis. Uh, the presence of law. Management may be more present and more prevalent in some areas than they are in others. Um, and then there's also local economics. Places like Savannah have a lot more tourism, have a lot more wealth in the area than in some place like Brunswick or Darien, Georgia. And again, you can expand this out to the regional social environment as well, where you have fishery councils that, are in, that encompass Georgia, they encompass the Southeast Atlantic, and then there's another fishery council for the entire Atlantic seaboard. And all these councilors are feeding into what's happening with a local fishery. Um, and there's regional and state politics as well. So who's sitting in the governor's mansion right now is really going to influence what the DNRs 
um, marching orders are going to be. Uh, and there's regional economics that change things. So if the state of Georgia or, or nearby areas that have tourists come in are depressed, then maybe there's not going to be as much demand along that, um, along that fishery. So what I'm illustrating here is that you can really expand this out again and again and again, and it's scalar and it's, con it's complex. And that's something you're going to hear, I'm sure, a lot in a lot of these integrative um, presentations. So the social and the ecological context really do matter, especially when you're thinking about sea level rise. So if I want to understand how sea level rise is going to impact this system, oh, I just used that word, <laughs> is going to affect this system, um, you really have to understand how the system is working today. And so that is pretty much the crux of what I'm trying to do is piece apart these complexities and understanding where that is going to introduce trade-offs into management decisions and conservation policies in the future. So as I said, a recap of my research objectives are to um, really understand the socio-ecological implications of sea level rise. And on the ecological side, my hope is to really piece apart what that spatial relationship of nekton, which is um, all fish and crustaceans swimming through the water, um, with the salt marsh, and do a mathematical model of that that I can push into the future with the effects of sea level rise. Socially, I'm interested in understanding the system as it is now with the fishers and how they are relating to the system. Now there's a lot of creel surveys that happen and a creel survey is you go out and you ask fishermen how many fish did you catch, how many did you throw back. There's a lot of that that already happens. Um, and this is trying to get at it a little bit deeper. I want to understand what their current conservation values are, what their attitudes towards management are. Do they feel empowered in the system to make changes if they want to? So are they all sitting on these, on these councils or are they being left out of the, um, of the talks? And then finally, what are the fishers' concerns for the future of this fishery? As sea level rise even on their radar, you get some really angry responses sometimes when you talk about sea level rise to them. Um, and, ag and again, that there's going to be a lot of regional variation. I don't think what's happening around Savannah in that Wausau Sound is necessarily going to be the same thing, social or ecologically, that's going to happen down in Darien or Brunswick. So understanding how management should adapt to these different areas is going to also be pretty important for conservation in the future. So this is just a very brief research plan. And again, if you really want to know the techn technical details of how I'm going to do what I'm going to do, we can talk about it at the break um, or later. Uh, but what I'm going to do for the next two years is conduct broad scale ecological surveys of juvenile fishes and crustaceans throughout the Georgia estuaries along this landscape um, uh, gradient of salt marsh between April and September, and that's going to capture the entire variation. Well, it won't capture the entire variation, but uh, capture some of the uh, most productive time of the, um, of the year. And then model this data using generalized linear mixed models. These mathematical models then can be pushed into the future with sea level rise scenarios. And finally, on the social um, aspects, I'm hoping to conduct focus groups and interviews with key, um, key informants through different strata of fishers, geographically and by type. So we have a variety of different commercial fishers. We have shrimp fishers, we have crab fishers, we have fin fish um, commercial fishermen. And then we also have um, leisure fishermen who come in non-commercially. We have charter boat captains. And we also have a, a set uh, a set of subsistence fishing that is also happening on the coast here. And I really like to understand how this uh, changes. So with that, I have a lot of organizations to thank for their support. Um, my committee, uh, uh, Pat Gear and Dorset Hurley, who are both from the DNR, who have been instrumental in, in, um, in getting me connected down on the coast. And a special thanks to everyone who's helped me out already in collecting data, um, especially my uh, my co-PhD student on this project. She is working on um, how uh, birds are going to be impacted by sea level rise. So with that, I think I have about 30 seconds for questions, so. <laughs>